Please morning. do sit down. Um, I have just a couple of announcements this morning. Um, a reminder that we've got a meeting upstairs, the Methodist folk meeting upstairs about the LEP immediately after church. So you're asked to get your coffee and then move up um, so that we can get on with the meeting. Um, and the other thing is that Catherine has got a special birthday this week. Um, and she wants us all to share in that celebration and we want to share with her. Um, so uh, in a minute, we're going to sing happy birthday. Um, but just to tell you that there is cake um, so I didn't mention it when I said about coffee going upstairs, but cake as well should go upstairs, please. So get your coffee and cake um, to help Catherine celebrate after the service. And now, Gemma, could you leave us, please? <laughs> And now all that's left for me to do is to hand over to David here. You all know David Spears, I'm sure. If not, well, you're in for a lovely service this morning and you'll get to know him better throughout that. David. Yes. Thank you, Lois. The Lord be with you. It's wonderful to be here at Kingsthorpe Baptist Church for this service of all age worship as we come together to worship God this morning and celebrate his love for us. Let's just begin a moment of quiet so we can be aware of God's presence amongst us this morning, holding us in love and inviting us to draw closer into his presence that we might be shaped by his word and by his grace. From different lives, we come to worship. From good weeks and bad weeks, we come to worship, bringing great times and painful memories, we come to worship, needing healing, needing peace, we come to worship. With hope in our hearts, we come to worship, to the almighty God, we come to worship. To the King of Kings, we come to worship. Together, we come to worship. And so we sing our opening song, which is number 73 in Songs of Fellowship. Number 73, come on and celebrate his gift of love. We will celebrate. Come on and celebrate.
during this service, if anyone feels that they would like to, we do have some crowns to decorate at the front of the church. Um, and the reason we have crowns is that we're thinking about two kings this Sunday, David, who would become king of Israel, and Jesus, who is the king of everything. So let's just begin with some prayers of praise and adoration and prayers of confession. So let's pray together. Gracious God, as we come together this morning as your family in this place, we give you praise for who you are to us. Our amazing God, who created everything that is seen and unseen, the earth below and the heavens above, all of it is part of the patchwork that you have woven together. And we give you praise for the love and the care that you have for each and every one of us. That you are not an isolated God, but that you are involved in our lives from the very beginning. You know us better than we know ourselves. You knitted us together in our mother's wombs and you journey with us through life. Gracious God, we praise you for your son, Jesus, who came down amongst us so that we might see you face to face, so that we might know your love in his teaching and healing and feeding and all that he is and has done. And most of all, we praise you for what Jesus has accomplished through the cross and the resurrection, the promise of new life and life eternal for each and every one of us who accepts the gracious invitation of Jesus to be within our lives. And we praise you too for your Holy Spirit that gives us life, that guides us, counsels us, strengthens and comforts us in times of challenge and difficulty and reminds us that you are real and you are here today. Yet, holy God, we confess that so often we forget all these things. We do not put you at the center of our lives, but instead we try to work on our own power our own strength, our own ability, and we stumble and fall. Gracious God, we want to say sorry for the ways that we have not followed you, for the ways that we have not loved you or loved our neighbor as we should have done, and for the ways that we have not done the things that we should have done. Gracious God, in this quiet moment, we come before you now and we ask for your forgiveness and that you would set us on the right path again as we quietly offer up our regrets and our confessions. Merciful God, you take away the sins of the world through Jesus. And through your spirit, we are set free, liberated by your love and offered the way of Jesus. So set our hearts and minds in your love and guide us on our journey together as your people. And we thank you that you forgive us fully in Christ. And so we offer the prayer that our Savior and friend Jesus taught his disciples as we now pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to show you some slides now some images and i'd like you to tell me what you see on the screen so what do you see what is that an image of an old woman someone says a young woman is it an old woman or a young woman who thinks it's an old woman put your hand up who thinks it's a young woman what of you think it's a young woman? So those of you who think it's a young woman might be seeing this. This is a necklace here. And that is her face kind of looking that way. But if you see that as her mouth and that as her eyes, you might notice it turns into an elderly woman. Okay, let's have a look at another image. What's this? A horse? <laughs> Anyone see anything else? A seal. Did someone say a seal? Who thinks it's a horse or a donkey? Who thinks it's a seal? A few of you do. So you might think it's a donkey because you've got the ears at the top, the eyes there, the nose. But actually, if that is a face there, and that's a, a filica, and those are the back because you might be able to see a seal as well. Okay, let's try another one. We've got two more. What's this? A duck and a rabbit. <laughs> so if you're looking in this direction, you might see the beak in the eye. But if you're looking in this direction, you might see the eye and the ears. OK, and we've got one more. What color is the dress? Black and blue. Does anyone see gold and white? Some of you do. Who sees black and blue? Who sees gold and white? Mm, interesting. <laughs> it is, in fact, a black and blue dress, but the way that the light is reflecting on it means that our eyes can interpret it in another colour. Because it's possible to see things from different perspectives, and it's possible to see one thing but not see another thing and that's what we're looking at in this service we're looking at david who was a little boy who would become a king and defeat goliath and we're also looking at jesus and his rejection in nazareth so we're going to watch a short video now and it's all about david and goliath slapstick theater David and Goliath. This is David. Hey. David was a shepherd who lived in Bethlehem. David was chosen by God to be the next king of Israel when he was just a boy. But David had to wait a very long time until that promise would come true because there was another king of Israel named Saul. Saul led the armies of Israel. One day, King Saul was with his army near the Valley of Ella. On the other side of this valley, the Philistines, the enemies of Israel, gathered their army ready to fight. The Philistines had a giant warrior named Goliath who challenged the Israelites. Hey! Goliath spoke badly of God and his people. He shouted and taunted them, saying, Choose one man to come down here and fight me. The Israelites and King Saul were very afraid. Meanwhile, David's father sent David to bring some food to his brothers and their captain. Goliath came out of the Philistines' army, and David heard him shout his usual mean taunts to the army of Israel. Whoa, what? As soon as the Israelites saw Goliath, they began to run away in fright. See ya. David asked, who is this Philistine anyway, that he has allowed to defy the armies of the living God? 
David's questions were reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. Uh, hi. David said, don't worry about this Philistine, I'll go fight him. Saul said, there's no way you can fight him and win, you're only a boy. Wait. But David told Saul that he had taken care of his father's sheep and rescued them from lions and bears. Then David declared, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and bear will rescue me from this Philistine. So Saul said, all right, go ahead and may the Lord be with you. David picked up five smooth stones from a stream. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight Goliath. When Goliath saw him coming, he sneered at him and yelled bad things at David. But David said, you come to me with a sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of Heaven's armies. Goliath moved closer to attack and David quickly ran out to meet him. He hurled a stone from his sling and hit Goliath in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. But he knew the power of God and trusted God to win the battle against the giant. So the story of David is one of unexpected surprises. And it begins when Samuel is sent to anoint the future king of Israel from the sons of Jesse. And when he comes to Jesse's household, he expects that the oldest son, Elib, would be the one who would be chosen because Elib is tall and handsome and strong. But God says to Samuel, don't regard his appearance or how tall he is. God doesn't care about the outward appearances of human beings. God cares about what's in the heart. And so Samuel meets the sons of Jesse and God keeps saying to him, no, not this one, no, not this one, no, not this one. And they get through all the sons and Samuel says, well, do you have any others? Jesse says, yes, I have a son who's the youngest and he's tending the sheep. And then when the youngest David came forward, God said to Samuel, this is the future king you will anoint. But David has to wait a long time before he becomes king, 20 years in fact, and yet God has set him on a journey that will get him to that point. So the current king, Saul, is unwell. He is troubled by a spirit, but they knew that music would calm him. And so one of his officials suggests, I know someone called David, he plays the lyra, which is a stringed instrument. We should invite him to play for the king. And so this early form of music therapy takes place and helps Saul. And he's so calmed and pleased by the music that he hears from David, he gives him a role in his court. He makes him his armor bearer, which is a ceremonial role, which would mean that he would look after the armor of the king. And that's why the king already knows David when he comes to this battle. So they're, they're coming up to this battle with the Philistines and the Philistines have a secret weapon They've got a hired gun in their midst. That's Goliath. Now, although Goliath is part of the Philistine society, he comes from a place called Gath. And these are fearsome warriors. And he's described in the Bible as being 10 feet tall with heavy armor and a huge javelin, which is like a spear. And when the two armies are lining up for battle, they send forth Goliath who says to them, who will challenge me? And he lays down a challenge to the army of Israel and says, send forth your champion. And if your champion wins, we'll surrender. However, if Goliath wins, you must surrender to us. Now, David's brothers are part of the army. Okay, they're serving soldiers because they're, they're very strong, they're very able. But David, although he has this ceremonial wall as armor bearer, he is still doing his uh, work um, with the sheep. He's a shepherd. 
But he comes to the battlefield, he comes to deliver supplies, and he comes to meet with his brothers. And while he's meeting with his brothers, Goliath comes out again and says, who will challenge me? And lays down the challenge again. And the army of Israel begins to falter as some of the men start to peel away from the front line. But David looks at Goliath and thinks, yeah, I can take him down. Now he ends up before Saul, and you can kind of understand why Saul would be skeptical, because David, this little boy, wants to take down this enormous, well-armed giant. And Saul doesn't know how he's going to do this, but David reminds him that God is with him, and also he has the experience of a shepherd, of taking down lions and bears. So Saul gives David some armor, and it's really heavy, and a huge sword. And David's walking around and says, I can't fight in this. This isn't what I used to fight. So he takes it all off, and he gets his sling and five small rocks, pebbles from the river, and puts it in his satchel. And then he goes out to meet Goliath. And what do you think Goliath thinks of this little boy coming to meet him? not impressed in fact he is insulted and it says in the bible that he um is envious of david because he's young and handsome and presumably goliath is this big ugly brute and he says to him am i a dog that you're going to attack me with sticks and this is what david says from one samuel you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the armies, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have insulted. Today the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down. And then everyone gathered here will know that the Lord can save without sword or spear, because the Lord determines every battle's outcome, and he will hand all of you over to us. This just annoys Goliath further. And so Goliath runs towards David to attack. And David takes a pebble, he puts it in his sling, and he fires it at Goliath. And Goliath goes down. He hits him right on the forehead. And he defeats Goliath, just as he says, without the need of a sword, because God was with him. And Saul and Goliath have both underestimated David because they looked at him and they thought, he's just a young boy, he can't do much. But David knew that God was with him and God had equipped him and therefore he could overcome this giant. And the same is for us as well. There are things in life, there are situations which seem to be enormous and undefeatable that can lead us to fear and overwhelm us and think there is nothing that we can do. But we have to remember that like David, we have a great big God behind us who can not only help us in the battles that we're fighting, but can be our victor for us. That we don't have to depend on our own strength, but rather we depend on the strength of the God who supports us from the very beginning. The God we are called to depend on in prayer and thanksgiving as God guides us and strengthens us. And that's true for us as individuals, but it's also true for us as a church as well. We cannot get anywhere simply by our own strength and power. We need the help of God through the Holy Spirit to guide us and equip us and enable us to the mission that God has given us today. So we're going to sing um, another song now, and it's called Our God is a Great Big God. Um, and I'm going to look silly now because I'm going to do the actions as well. And if you would like to join in with them, you'd be very welcome. And you might think this is a very simple song, but actually it speaks to a deep theology of who God is, that God is greater and bigger than we are. And yet despite being greater and bigger and transcendent, God holds us in his hands. 
and desires to be in relationship with each and every one of us. So we sing number 2004 in Songs of Fellowship, Our God is a Great Big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hand. to have our dramatized gospel reading uh, which comes from the gospel of mark chapter 6 verses 1 to 13 jesus is rejected at nazareth and sends out the 12 on a mission jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples when the sabbath came he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place 
and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself video, had given sorry. orders to have John arrested, <laughs> and he had him bound and put in the... I think the video goes on a bit longer. I thought I'd cut it off. <laughs> so there we have it. We have Jesus coming home to his uh, hometown of Nazareth, teaching in the synagogue and speaking with such authority and wisdom to the people who were listening to him. But as the passage tells us, the people know Jesus. They know his family. They knew him when he was a little boy. They know that he's the son of Mary. They know his siblings as well. And knowing all this, they reject Jesus because their perceptions are based on what they have seen through their limited view. It's a bit like David in some ways, the young shepherd boy who's laughed at, but actually beneath that is a king. Now Jesus is the son of God. People were speculating on who he, who he was, as we heard in that um, passage. He was, but he was the son of God, but people were not always able to see that because Jesus did not meet with their expectations. And because Jesus didn't meet their expectations, they could not see God at work in him. Now in the passage, when Jesus is rejected, he sees this as part of his prophetic task. And he, this means he's there to challenge people and to open their eyes and point them to God. And he notes that a prophet is never welcome in their home town. We might use the phrase familiarity breeds contempt. But because they know Jesus' family, they know he's from a humble origin, they can't believe he is who he claims to be. Jesus, therefore, does not do any big miracles in Nazareth. He does some healings of sick people. But interestingly, it suggests that the unbelief that the people have is some kind of limitation on what happens in that place. I find this a really interesting part of the passage. Why is it that Jesus does not perform deeds of power in Nazareth because of the unbelief of others? Well, perhaps it goes back to what we were studying as part of Bible Month in June, in Genesis, when we look at God's relationship with humanity. God doesn't want to impose himself upon us, but God rather wants to work in partnership with humanity. God has created the whole of the human race in his image and given the human race an important role in the work that God is doing. That is that human beings are to represent God to the rest of creation and work in partnership with him. And yet, God has also given human, human beings the ability to choose and to reject God. And so, in this instance, where people are rejecting Jesus, they are rejecting the God in Christ. And therefore, that limits what they can see God doing amongst them. The familiarity with, with which the people of Nazareth have with Jesus' family defines their expectations and leads them in the wrong direction because they're so wrapped up in their own notions and their own prejudices towards Jesus that they are unable to see what God could be doing through him. This lack of belief therefore limits the signs that perform, are performed amongst them. 
Now, perhaps this is a lesson for each and every one of us as well. Do we need greater conviction that Christ is with us through the Spirit and a greater openness to the works of power that can happen amongst us? Because this links in back to the first reading that we had, which was about David. People didn't believe in David because all they saw was a small boy, a shepherd. And yet God had chosen him and God was working through him and he relied on the strength and the power of God. And so if we think that we just rely on our own power and our own ability, of course we're not going to get very far or achieve very much. But if instead we rely on the power of God and depend on God, then as David and then Jesus shows, we can be helped and nothing is beyond. The next bit is also interesting because it's about Jesus sending his disciples. And he sends them out expecting that they will work in partnership with him. So just as God in Genesis partners with humanity, Jesus now partners with his disciples to take part in the work that he is doing. And he sends them out with authority. So go back to Genesis. God gives humanity authority and dominion, and now Jesus gives authority to those who follow him. And yet, although he vests them with power and authority, he also leaves them in a state of vulnerability and dependence. He says that they go out with no food or no money, but instead all that they have is a staff, just like David had, a staff, and they had to rely on the hospitality of strangers. And this means that they can't be arrogant. They can't lord it over the people they encounter because they're reliant on that hospitality. They have to be humble. They have to work with the kindness of others. They have to be welcomed into their homes. They need to be guests. Now, perhaps there's something that we can learn from that as well that we need to be humble and that we need to be invited in into the lives of others. That we're not called to lord it over people, to impose upon them, but we are called to build relationship with new people in new places and meeting them where they are. And in so doing, we put the welfare and the well-being of these people directly in front of us. Now we know what happens when people don't put the well-being of others first, when they don't regard the least. What happens is injustice and oppression and abuse. So we need to realize that that's our calling, not to be above others, but to serve others just as Jesus did. And we need to be open to God at work, not only in us, but in the world around us, that as we go out, we might encounter God in those places. And most of all, we can't be limited by our expectations, by our agendas, by our notions, because God is a God of surprises. He surprises us with who he calls and equips He surprises us in what he asks us to do. But most of all, he surprises us in Jesus, in who who God is in Christ. Jesus didn't come down as a, a, a conquering king with a sword and with armor. No, he comes as a baby born in Bethlehem into a poor and humble family. And Jesus spends his life and ministry on the edges with people on the margins. But most of all, Jesus surprises us in the cross through his death. Because the most terrible choice that people could have made to crucify God's son, in fact, becomes the means of humanity's salvation. Jesus' death and resurrection reminds us that God's love is more powerful than death. And that is hugely unexpected because death seems to be so powerful, doesn't it? Death is like Goliath, an enemy that cannot be overcome. 
the final enemy. But Jesus, the descendant of David and the son of God, shows that even the greatest enemy can be defeated. Jesus' victory on the cross and his resurrection defeats sin and death for us. And it gives us new life that cannot be taken away. Jesus offers a promise that we will always dwell with God forever and that nothing in the whole of creation can separate us from the love of God. And that's the essential message of the two passages that we've heard this morning, that God is with us, God holds us, and God never lets us go. And in Christ, even death has been overcome for us. And that's why we give thanks this morning, not because life isn't difficult or challenging, that there aren't obstacles that we have to occasionally overcome and difficulties that we have to get into, but that we have a God who is with us, who holds us in love and doesn't hold back, who gives us the gift of eternal life and sacrifice in his son, Jesus. And for that, we give our thanks and our praise. Amen. So we're going to sing again now. And it's a reminder that we are on a journey with God, step by step, as God God leads us and guides us. Number 1483 in Songs of Fellowship, one more step along the world I go, one more step along the world I go. world I go, one more step along the world I go, from the old things to the new, keep me travelling along with you, and it's from the old I travel to the new, keep me travelling along with you. Round the corners of the world I turn More and more about the world I learn All the new things that I see You'll be looking out along with me And it's from the old I travel to the new Keep me travelling along with you As I travel through the bad and good Keep me travelling the way I should Where I see no way to go You'll be telling me the way And it's from the old I travel to the new Keep me travelling along with you Give me courage when the world is rough Keep me laughing though the world is tough Leap and sing in all I do Keep me travelling along with you And it's from the old I travel to the new Keep me travelling along with you You are older than the world can be You are younger than the life in me Ever old and ever new Keep me travelling along with you And it's from the old I travel to the new Keep me travelling along with you Please be seated. 
Now, hopefully, um, when you came in this morning, you would have been given one of these uh, luggage labels, luggage labels, uh, which you might use when you're on a journey. And uh, these labels remind us of the journey in God, with God, but also our need to depend on God and to pray to God. So I'm going to ask you to talk to your neighbours around you and talk about one thing that you're thankful to God for this morning, one thing you're thankful for, and then another thing that you would like to be praying for, a situation in the world or in your lives that you need to pray for. So one thing that you're thankful for, one thing or a situation you should be praying for. And once we've done that, we're going to write on our luggage uh, uh, labels. On one side, that thankful thing, and on the other side, that situation we're going to be praying for. So I'll give you about um, uh, five minutes or so just to talk to those around you. What are you thankful for? And what situation should we be praying for? What are you thankful for this morning? Good health. Good health. <laughs> love, <laughs> love your neighbours, yourself, and love your enemies too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, hopefully, people are starting to love their neighbours. Um, it looks like you're on the, the label light writing stage. So, one thing you're thankful for, and one situation to be praying for, and then once you've written your label i invite you to come forward and to place the label on this tree in front of us the prayer tree and then what we'll do is we'll lift up all the prayers to god this morning
So let us pray together. Gracious God, you know what is on our hearts and on our minds. You know each and every one of our situations. You know all the things that are happening in the world. Yet we come before you now in thanksgiving and in intercession to offer these our prayers to you as we give thanks for who you are and your love for all of creation, but also that the world is marred and damaged and that healing and wholeness is needed. And so we lift up these prayers to you and ask for your help in all these situations. We pray especially for this morning for the work of Bethany Homestead as they search for new trustees. We pray too for all those who mourn and in particular for the family of Christopher who died suddenly yesterday. And we pray for Christopher's dad, Richard, and for Dawn. We pray for Mary Jacobs, who is unwell, and for Roe Cheeseman, who is having tests. Gracious God, we pray for the whole world. We pray for the new government and opposition that we have in this country. We ask that you would give them wisdom and discernment and a view of all people. Gracious God, before you rulers stand in silence, as we yearn for the day that your justice and mercy and wholeness will be known throughout the earth. And so we pray for all those places where there is division and conflict, where there is poverty and exclusion. And we are reminded that we are called to be part of your work in this world, to offer healing and wholeness, to take part in what you are doing amongst us, reconciling us with each other and with you, and enabling every human being to flourish in the fullness of their humanity as we are made in your image and in your likeness and for us Jesus came to save. So gracious and loving God we pray for all these concerns and we pray for the church and our role within the world help us we pray give us a vision and enable us to depend on your grace and love as we walk with you in your love and grace, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now we will um, have our offertory for this morning. Will we not? Is that a retiring collection? It's a retiring collection. Excellent. Adrian's nodding to me. So, so we'll go. Uh, um, so just to remind you, there is a retiring collection at the end of the service. And uh, we also have a meeting afterwards. Uh, 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 for the for the Methodists, um, looking at how we're moving together as two congregations. Um, so at the end of our service, we're going to sing a song, a song which is all about walking and marching with God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. And if you wanted to march along on the spot, you're very welcome to. Number 1076 in Songs of Fellowship, we are marching in the light of God.
And so we go into God's world in the knowledge of his presence and of his love and grace for every human being. So may the blessings of God, of Father, of Son, and of Holy Spirit, be with us and with all whom we love and those whom we ought to love this day and forevermore. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.